Hello world, this is CS50, week two continued. We're here again with our friend, Dan Armendariz. Hey everyone. Let's take a look. So what do we have on the, uh, right. on the plan today? The guy, is, I'm literally going to tell you. Well, I can't wait for you to <laughs> talk. <laughs> just sit, just sit with Now notice I'm black, I'm back to black. <laughs> back to my black uh, sweater instead of the, uh, the collared shirt that you so graciously pointed out last time. Wow, what an exciting way to open. Today's now this is our CS50 army explained. of elephants that we had been printing at that time. Did we have the uh, the glow in the dark elephants by then? Uh, I don't know if we had that material, but yeah, we had the the 3D printer we have allows you to print uh, glow in the dark material as well. Mm -hmm. So in to answer your question, what the guy on the screen is saying is that we introduced the first of our problem set specific uh, domain specific problem sets this week wherein we talk about cryptography and students implement a rotational cipher or two, a Caesar cipher, a Visionaire cipher, and then the hacker edition of problem set two. This past fall we had students crack a file of encrypted or hashed passwords. Oh. So we're about to see a, a teaser that I love showing that paints a picture of a rotational cipher taking a very physical incarnation from a very famous movie. And then later in this lecture what we'll do is introduce the first of our data structures. Very simple but in array so that we can also begin to look at what's underneath the hood when it comes to representing like a string, which of course is going to be just an array of characters. That was an amazing segue. Oh, was, was, no, was that was pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah, it was okay. You love this clip. It's a great clip. I just got to say, for, it's a great clip. for as long as I have been helping you with classes, which I think the first one was 2005, I think you've been showing this clip. It's a good clip. Ten years. It's an old movie. It's, it's even older little, than that. It's a little overplayed. I mean, well, back it literally then, plays barely... around the holidays, twenty-four-seven. <laughs> well, but nowadays, cable. but nowadays people don't really have cable. Nor do they have four by three aspect ratios, but we're still showing it. <laughs> but it, you should convert it to HD. Just artificially and then stretch clip it. The... That's the worst when people like. No, not stretch it. You just clip the the top and bottom, and you know, That's... expand the whole thing. What was that? The digital effect sound? <laughs> you know, a little grow. Yeah. Can we enhance that? No, no <laughs> you can't enhance this. Look at this. This is this is decades. This is a high quality version too. Really? You mean you found you went to YouTube and searched for <laughs> HD Christmas Carol? Maybe I don't know who was ever released though in HD. <laughs> so what Ralphie is doing here is, of course, is decoding a message that the radio is broadcasting, and he's using the little decoder ring that allows him to map one character to another. I'm amazed Ovaltine has not given you just an enormous amount of money. This is CS50, this. brought to you by <laughs> Ovaltine. <laughs> no, I've never actually tried Ovaltine. What? Really? But I'm sure it's delicious. Whoa, whoa, big reveal all of a sudden. I've never tried Ovaltine. How old do you think I am? Well, apparently too old to have tried Ovaltine. Yeah. So that means you're older than this clip. When did this movie come out, 80s? <laughs> You gotta Google that. <laughs> 80s. <laughs> this is great. This is Spence Builds. Gee whiz. That's the best part right there. <laughs> oh, be sure to. Be sure to what? What was little orphan Annie trying to say? Be sure to How can you not be drawn in by this? The artificial drama is just the best to play. Great. Little do they know there's computer science on the horizon. <laughs> Even we're getting wrapped up in this. <laughs> so you guys for crying out loud? Oh, these are great. It's about to escalate though. Yes, 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 yes. Be sure to drink your oral tea. Ovaltine? A crummy commercial? Mm. Son of a bitch. <laughs> or in David's speak, advertisement. So that, that always gets a laugh. Nobody now pe no, people were laughing, you just no. can't hear them through my mic. Mm. No, there's a lot of laughter. They had to add that in post. We yeah, should, we they, should they add, add a laugh, laugh track. track. Yeah. Should add a laugh track to this show. It's like so this is, let me interject, yeah. mm -hmm. um, this is an invitation that has long since expired, but we start in the, toward the beginning of the fall semester, a tradition every year of inviting about 50 students to uh, lunch on a Friday afternoon when class would otherwise meet, uh, were we not just a Monday and Wednesday class. 
uh, to Fire and Ice, which is this uh, fun restaurant in Harvard Square uh, that essentially has a buffet and allows students to get most anything. But the goal really is to have a very casual environment and make a very large class feel much smaller. And we generally invite friends from industry or alumni to come back and chat with students about what their experience at Harvard was like, what their experience in industry is like or in graduate school and generally to give students a window into the application of computer science in the real world, mm -hmm. especially in the tech industry. And I think you started talking about strings, so what is the context here? Is this a continuation of the discussion earlier in the week where you were talking about um, data types? To some extent. So now we're looking at a more sophisticated data type, if you will, one that is a uh, combination of a smaller, multiple instances of a smaller data type, in this case, chars. And what I'm proposing is just how we might start to think about a string, the Mila, and the characters of her name. And we haven't necessarily introduced the lower level implementation details yet, but I've put a box around each of the letters in her name to kind of capture the fact that this is a char, 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 and maybe something more but we're going to then do a reveal before long as to what's actually going on underneath the hood. And what's nice about this and what's nice about C, I think, is the fact that now that we have the vocabulary of the primitive chars and ints and floats and doubles and shorts, you can then think about how you might represent words and phrases and sentences and paragraphs, but it's not necessarily obvious now how to map that onto last time's lessons. And so what we're hopefully going to do here is begin to layer on top of previous material in the form of these arrays. And that eventually will lead us to an even more sophisticated discussion of memory and memory management. To what degree do you actually go into the discussion of how the computer is able to do memory addressing and these sorts of things? Because they do, we'll get, do there. get to... Um, well, we do, to pointers, so to speak. Um, we get there within the next couple of weeks uh, when we don't use that nomenclature just yet. But I do think it's a nice natural progression of talking about arrays and strings in this case by some kind of indexing. Let's just call this 0, 1, 2, 3 and keep it simple. And then we have a nice mapping to the now familiar for loop, which by convention would start looping at 0. And notice too, you'll notice this is deliberately buggy at this point. And this isn't a uh, scratching my chin kind of moment. Oh, you just did though. What? You just, you just you did a little. You but I haven't compiled scratch. anything yet. So you, you don't know that I don't know what's going on. But the fact that I left the space, oh, that's I know the tell you here. Know. Huh. No, that's the tell. You mean I've the three course. question marks that were not, you just deleted them. There are three question marks that you... No, 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 not there. I mean up top. Lines one and two are blank. I oh, clearly I see. left room for a solution to the problem that uh, I know, that I know is on the horizon. Mm. So we're introducing some new syntax here, the square bracket notation, mm -hmm. and then talking ultimately about what that means. So this is a bit mechanical here, but what's nice about the square bracket notation too is it kind of has that... Um, a nice mental mapping, I think, to the squares that represent Zamila's name, for instance. Mm -hmm. And the, the only trickery here, perhaps, is just remembering we start counting from zero, at least by convention. And even if we have our for loop counting from one on up, we still have to zero index the arrays. Mm -hmm. So there we go. So it was a nice opportunity for some input. And here, too, we're trying to tie together, if briefly, some previous, some most recent material before we launch ahead to something more sophisticated. And you'll notice here I've continued using make quite a bit. Um, in the past, um, actually in a recent class, we, you saw me perhaps typing out clang and the actual command line uh, arguments, dash o and dash l cs50, and we very quickly move away from that and we've instead pre-configured the appliances environment variables to use certain flags, c flags as they're called by default so that students can really focus on the conceptual process of like, let me build my code and let me worry a little less at this point in the term certainly about what all of those uh, minor details are. Important, but minor relative to the, the more interesting problems at hand. So it turns out we can dynamically figure out the length of a string by calling a function called stir length. Again, so this is nice. We're introducing another function because we haven't given them all that many just yet. And in fact, many of them have come from us in the CS50 library. But this is going to invite ultimately a question as to how is Sterling implemented? Can we distill that into its essence? So, uh, so here we are, deliberately or non deliberately, uh, introducing another bug. I've forgotten to include another header file. Have you considered in the past using? Uh, or creating perhaps or modifying even the language so that some of the syntax no longer becomes relevant. So in other words, 
there's been a lot of discussion, I think even we have talked about the choice of C in the past and how using C is good because, or your argument for using C is, is a good one in that it allows students to kind of understand a little more about what's happening behind the scenes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there's also uh, an approachability to other higher level languages that makes it easier for them to, for them being students, to be able to start writing and not get so tripped up over some of mm -hmm. the specifics for syntax. Have you considered doing something where you essentially create your own language, like a CS50 language, yeah. and um, do things like uh, make the semi, not the semicolons, sorry, the, or perhaps make the semicolons optional, don't really need semicolons mm -hmm. at the end, and remove the curly braces, but require indenting, so almost like Python syntax, but still retain the elements of the C language. I've had that same instinct, but then I've stopped myself, because one detail that's important to me is that even if students aren't going to use C for quite some time, I do want them to feel like they're using real tools and real world tools. And coming up with a, a toy language, even if pedagogically it is far more compelling than the ones we're using, I think there's trade-offs there. Mm -hmm. And because for about half of our students in CS50, CS50 is a terminal class, they never again take uh, another computer science or programming class, I really want the returns, the practical returns of the class to be as high as possible. And that's not to say we couldn't achieve those goals by at least simplifying some details, like the semicolons and the like. But to be honest, if they're going to move on after 50 and teach themselves other languages, I don't necessarily think it's a, a bad thing or a net negative that they have to struggle with some of these details because they're going to run into those kinds of issues in other languages. So I'd rather put on training wheels that make particularly compelling pedagogical sense, like the CS50 library, and that persuades me. But writing our own language and giving students essentially a sandbox environment is, it, it just doesn't resonate with me in the same way. It feels like it's too much, over, too much simplification. So before we were talking about um, string strlan, I forget exactly how you, how you put it. Sterling? Sterling, yeah. Uh, that function there. And, and again, you, you were mentioning how you would talk about the, um, the implementation of that. But the question that I had first wasn't necessarily, oh, how is this implemented? Because you've described these as being a bit of a black box and that we don't really have to understand how they work, just that their implementation is provided to us. But my question was, how do I know what the list of possible functions that I could type are? That is a perfect segue for something we will touch on in this lecture, which is a resource that we put together based on uh, freely available information called Reference 50, mm -hmm. uh, which is our own simplification of things that are generally known as man pages or manual pages. So what we ultimately teach students to get into the habit of doing is if they want to look up a function's prototype or signature, as well as documentation, therefore, to type something like man sterling at a command prompt in, for instance, the CS50 appliance. The downside of man pages is that many of them are fair, they're written for a more technical audience. They're written with an assumption of some programming background or familiarity with man pages, and that's not ideal in these first weeks of the class. So what we did with Reference 50 is uh, CS50's own Rob Bowden kindly converted all of the man pages for C from the Ubuntu distribution that it underlies the CS50 appliance, and essentially converted them to a format that we can then render dynamically in a web page, re reference 50. And then the staff also wrote simpler definitions of those functions, those man pages, the le a less comfortable version of the man pages. So what reference 50 provides with students is a more comfortable version, which is the raw man pages uh, untouched, and then the less comfortable version, which just uses a little more down-to-earth English. And maybe we gloss over certain details, and we use an int instead of size t, for instance, just to keep it a little more familiar early on. Um, but man pages ultimately would be the official way to get authoritative information mm -hmm. for function. But that, I think, also addresses that the question directly, which is, do they, is there a list of functions that they can... In Reference 50, yes. Yeah. And we also point so them to... table of contents, basically. Indeed. And actually, it's evolved over time, but on CSSB's website, we very often link to a... Um, our own adaptation of a website called cppreference.com, which was mostly focused in C++, but it was made available as open source, and so um, we were allowed to edit it, and we essentially removed the C++ stuff, left the C stuff, so that too is another resource for students where they can see string-related functions, math-related functions, and a few other things as well. So even though we're in a uh, theater environment, both there and here physically, I do think that 
it's not a non-starter to try to have a discussion in class or at least to invite audience participation. And in fact, you'll see me as often as possible try to pause for audience input, which is one meant to just take the emphasis off of me and my voice, but two, also to keep people as engaged as possible. And by certainly not everyone's going to want to speak up in a classroom of this size, and that's fine because there's other ways they can engage in, in sections and 650 discussions online and so forth. But I think it makes things more interesting if there's a little bit of back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, it's important though for a class of any size, even if it's 30 students instead of 800, to try to load balance among the students who you're calling on. And it's sometimes hard for me because I, I get these sort of default instincts to go to someone who's a familiar face or the hand that I keep seeing going up. Mm -hmm. But I think you want to rotate and you want to pull in different voices and sometimes wrong voices. And then if a student is wrong, this is often a it can feel like a tricky situation because you don't want to sort of discourage them, but I think you also don't want to mislead the whole class. And so I would generally try to say, no, not correct, but really good thought, and then move on. Um, and I think just being explicit about the answer but being gentle about the response is a nice mix there. Mm -hmm. And hopefully a student wouldn't feel discouraged if you, and shouldn't, especially if you don't make a big deal out of the answer being wrong. In fact, sometimes what I'll do too is preface my remarks with, you know, especially if less comfortable, or especially if you have no prior experience, what's the answer? To try to create in students' minds a sort of safe space in which to answer, because I've essentially asked the more comfortable students not to respond to this particular question. It doesn't always work, mm -hmm. but hopefully it didn't motivate some all the more students to feel comfortable participating. In this case, it has no functional impact, and in general... So I'm struck by a comment that you made a couple of a couple of times ago and a couple of videos mm -hmm. ago about um, how you want to try to minimize talking, basically doing this. You want to try to minimize talking about code directly and talk a little bit more about the concepts. We're getting there though. So this is, uh, this is the end of our third week of class and you'll very quickly see that later today uh, we'll focus on data structures and we'll focus on memory and things will start becoming more pictorial and less code based. And indeed next week we'll take that even further as we start to talk about algorithms and searching and sorting and the like. So it's coming, I promise. All right, All right. Yeah, still, still waiting. I probably, it's still the same week. I know it feels like a month now, but it, it, it's well, the same week. In actual time, I think it has been about a month. You shouldn't make fun of it, um, but you will come to see code as something beautiful. Uh oh, now it's getting awkward. Now they're making fun of me. <laughs> They're making it awkward because you're making it awkward. Yeah. <laughs> you do not need to say int n. So because we have already said int, you do not need to say it again. This is demonstrative too, I think, of things that even I take, start to take for granted quickly. Like it makes perfect yeah. sense to me that int only goes on the left. And it often, frankly, doesn't wouldn't even occur to me that a student might wonder, Absolutely. why do you not have to say int on the right too? Because n or i is still an int. Why don't you have to specify it again? Why don't you have to specify it every time you're using it? What kind of right. So we try to make the distinguishing, uh, the, uh, we try to distinguish them between the initialization and the update and the condition. Mm -hmm. But these are the kinds of things too that the more and more I teach the class and the sort of further I get from being a student myself, I think the more often I forget those kinds of assumptions that I'm making. Well, in this particular case, you might be able to modify, and I realize that you've slowly modified this for loop to show uh, some other specifics about how that actually works. Mm -hmm. But I would suggest maybe, or one of the one of the avenues of discussion that I haven't noticed in CS50 is that you can initialize, you can create an i variable before the for loop. So before the mm. for loop is actually even defined, you do int i equals zero, or mm -hmm. you can, mm -hmm. and then and then go in, in that direction. That might help kind of answer that question of why do you not need to. Because there may be something else going on, on uh, in that student's mind about the, yeah. the scope of the variable, perhaps, or... Um, well, I think it's easier to introduce, to declare the variable within the for loop and then claim, because of the syntax, it's scoped to the loop only. When, of course, if you put it the line above, you're now scoping well, right, but it more. That's, but that's part of the discussion, I would think, uh, could be that, and, and to say that... You know, talking about the scope of this variable yeah. is an important aspect of that of that for loop. And you know, we kind of come up to that, I think, when we talk about either in class or in one of the walkthroughs I do online, uh, like a do while loop or a while loop, where we do we don't have a syntactic opportunity to declare it within the body of the loop, mm -hmm. and so we instead need to do it up front. And here too, you actually touch on, 
I think a reality of a lot of textbooks and online references because C back in the day required that all of your variables be declared up front, the top of your program before you begin to actually implement any logic. You still see lots of examples like that. We in CS50 have, for design and stylistic reasons, strongly encouraged students to scope their variables as locally as possible. Um, both because one, it makes it more readable if you can see very locally where, how and where something was declared, but also just in terms of knowing where and when your data is in scope. Reduces aliasing bugs or some. Mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. You don't like want to use I, have I changing variables, and changing values in places you right. had forgotten about. So right. scoping I just to the loop in which it's used is, I think, a, a worthy goal. Mm -hmm. So here, it looks like you're now trying to iterate over a loop. And how many characters. Times is that iterate? Yeah, we're getting to the point of peeling back the layer of what's really going on with a string. Mm -hmm. And we'll actually invite a student up on stage during this class. Um, one, to kind of vary things visually and experientially, but also to give us an opportunity to wrestle more visually with what might be going on. We'll use the, the screen for that. I'll admit I hate dropping out of Keynote and doing something like that, but sometimes I need to skip around or change state. So this is an example, very mechanical, but it's meant to hopefully paint a clearer picture of this one-to-one -one mapping between numbers and characters as we discussed in the previous class, ASCII in particular. And I'm even using some unnecessary syntax. We don't have to explicitly cast to a char here, but I was trying to make clear that we're actually taking I, forcing it to a char, even though it would also happen implicitly in this case. Not as an integer, but as a char. Thereby showing me the character. And really the goal here too in this class was I wanted to introduce this concept of casting, treating a number as a character and a character as a number, because in this most recent week's problem set we're going to introduce, as Ralphie's clip uh, suggested, cryptography. And cryptography we use in the context of just text, and so encrypting textual messages. And so I wanted students to sort of be prepared in terms of the language's capabilities for this for taking a text and treating it not as characters but as numbers so that with numbers you can do arithmetic and achieve something like Ralphie's algorithm there of just rotating letters somehow. And to rotate it's perhaps easier to think about it in rotating with arithmetic um, operations and adding numbers instead of just adding characters, which you could do but it would just feel a little weird. And this I say, would say is common too. In the problem set, for cryptography, we don't necessarily review this material of ASCII. We don't necessarily give students the code with which you can convert a char to an int or vice versa. But we sort of plant these, these hints or seeds along the way so that lectures themselves don't address the problem sets head on necessarily, but plant these seeds that students can hopefully realize the connection. It's interesting that uh, it seems like you could potentially here have uh, a live demonstration of students um, manipulating some variable over a loop. Mm -hmm. um, so in a similar vein to what we've seen in, in prior lectures where you have some students come up and actually act out some of these things. It seems like um, you don't really do that quite so much for things like loops and other no, constructs. And that's I mean, I'm not opposed to adopting a compelling example. I feel like some of these ideas like loops are, are fairly intuitive, syntactically not obvious at all with the initialization, the condition, and the update. But to be able to wrap your mind around the notion of just something cyclical or a loop, that I think, I worry sometimes we'd be belaboring the point. Like if we had a student come up on stage and do the same thing again and again and again, I do worry that we'd be running the risk of um, assuming too little of the students in the class. Mm -hmm. So that would, that's the reason why, and that and lack of inspiration. Open to suggestions. In fact, one of the suggestions you made will come up in, a, uh, in an upcoming lecture where we actually use playing cards as an opportunity to sort, and the, that's one of the algorithms on the horizon, sorting. We're using multiple header files, among which is our new friend string. Now this looks at first glance a little cryptic. It does, now that I look at it again. Yeah. First I get a string from the user, and I put that string in a variable called f. Copy, paste. So here we see a prefabricated example that's already commented and nicely indented and styled and so forth. And this, I think, is an important 
preparation detail to actually arrive with everything sort of pre-baked, so to speak. Even if you recreate some of those examples, or even if you go in temporarily, delete the code, but leave the comments, because you want students to have a clean and absolutely correct version with which to tinker, or at least read uh, once they're back home. And the reality is, based on questions, based on how I tend to explain something in a given day, might not even have time to touch on everything. So making sure that there's a canonical coverage in the form of the code itself and also the walkthroughs that I've alluded to, I think has been pretty key to giving ourselves the freedom to sort of pause and not know how long this moment is going to last, but to be able to go with it and not worry about like staying on schedule by constantly checking the time or rushing just because you feel you have some arbitrary milestones to hit. So in the code, it looked like you were trying to detect whether a character was in, was within a range of characters. So right here, the highlighted, this highlighted mm -hmm. line, mm -hmm. it's greater than lowercase a and mm -hmm. less than lowercase. Looks like lowercase c. Mm -hmm. So why is it? Uh, it seems like it might be more intuitive to students if you were to flip the first two terms. If a is less than or equal to S of I, yeah, and so yeah. S of I is less than or equal to Z. Is there any particular reason that you chose this particular example? Yes, I see what you're saying, to sort of get this nice pretty symmetry where the variable's in the middle. Um, mostly so that the signs go in the same way, and so that the question you're asking is, is sort of structured the same. Um, no, it's greater than A and less than... Sorry, not the C. sign, sort of the logic. So is the ith character greater than or equal to A? Mm -hmm. And is the ith character less than or equal to Z? So I think we could play it your way, too. That was just the sort of English sentence that I had in mind. That's all we're expressing here logically, a little cryptically, but ultimately pretty straightforward. This is but this is one of the first few examples, too, where I think we're really perhaps taking this step toward the promised goal of teaching students to think more carefully. Like, what does it mean for a, a character to be lowercase? You know, irrespective of ASCII and numbers and data representation, what does it mean? Well, it means that the letter is either A or later or it's Z or prior, or and it's Z or prior. And so expressing that now is the first step toward expressing yourself as a human, I think, more precisely. Well, you said uh, irrespective. I think this is actually heavily de dependent on the implementation of ASCII. Well, but I chose my word. OK, sure. You, you, I'm assuming there is a contiguousness to the letters mm -hmm. and that they're sort of monotonically increasing for, in some sense. Right. But I think that's intuitive, right? Most people would assume, that, and this is why I chose my words carefully there, A or later or Z or I think I said earlier, mm -hmm. just because I am assuming this linearity to the alphabet. But that has fundamentally nothing to do with numbering systems right. until you apply that mapping. Right. I mean, I do love how we're having these very technical, sophisticated conversations with an army of plastic elephants around us. <laughs> it's like I brought my stuffed animals in from home. <laughs> That's, what was it, minus A minus A? That's kind of a... Minus A. Minus A minus A. Minus A. Oh, that. That is, yeah. It's funny because that that, um, uh, yeah. that needs the most amount of explanation, I think. I know, and it's such a simple thing to explain. It's just, it, the goal is so simple. You'll notice, though, that I've left the second uh, laptop at home, suggestive that I have confidence in the state of that one computer's operating system and software can set up. Will we get to see a crash today? Just for no, good thankfully. <laughs> I don't think we had any technical issues along those lines this year. Hmm. Although I think the, 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 the touch screen on the right, the Surface, I do think locked me out one or more times since it went into sleep mode and I didn't happen to know the latest password on it. So we just worked around you that You didn't issue. know, you don't know your own password? Well, no, a bunch of us share the hardware, so it had gone to sleep unintentionally. And uh, tell us more about your security, security practices. practices. Yeah. <laughs> well, our systems are very secure because very few of us even know the passwords. In fact, even I can't get into them. If it's not a lowercase letter in the first place, I just that doesn't seem very secure. No, it's very secure. I can't <laughs> hack into our systems. Nor can I draw things on the screen when it's locked. <laughs> or occasionally, when swiping through the surface among apps, I, I want to get to the drawing app, and then all of a sudden, there's like, cut the rope, or angry birds, because someone's been <laughs> playing video games before class started. 
which we actually encourage on the big touch screen. It's kind of a fun way to start class, though this year we did music instead of video games. So this is a progression. So in this version here, we're taking a step away from implementing this myself from the ground up to now standing on the shoulders of someone else, introducing man pages like we discussed a little bit ago, and actually using, um, building our code on top of someone else's. Mm -hmm. And so this is pretty common, at least now that we're getting into the more slightly longer programs of the semester, whereby it might make sense to have a simple version, slightly more sophisticated, more sophisticated, really sophisticated version. I try to do them as a progression so that I don't just have version one and version two. I instead have this progression, each of which manifests some marginal change so that when we talk about them or when students look at them, they only have to focus on one new idea at a time. And it can be sum uh, summarized in the comments atop the file even with just a single phrase or sentence as to what this does. And I think that's a little easier to sort of have these minor deltas as you take steps up to something more complicated rather than just take the first version and then show students the last version and leave it to them to extrapolate what were all the intermediate steps. This aspect though is really heavily focused on the programming portion itself rather than the... The algorithms? Rather than the, well, the concepts. So this, that really uh, cryptic looking minus a minus a for example yeah is that's fair it that is um a direct implementation of you know the yeah ascii that you were showing before but it seems interesting to be able to actually talk more about that concept and then it is show them an example a specific example like this and then allow them to kind of yeah well, well, what we're really talking about is how, how did the person who implemented two upper or two lower probably do it? We've given them one way. In years past, actually, last time we talked about bitwise operators a bit. In the past, we actually used a nice bitwise operator trick whereby you just flip one of the bits and you can actually force something to upper or lower case. And I've jettisoned that uh, in class just because didn't want to get uh, too deep into that sort of neat trick, if you will, um, even though there's some interesting discussions that can arise. Oh. <laughs> Apparently, if I purse my lips and look up, I'm looking for the solution, I'm looking for the answer. But I would push back. I, I sense a, a theme here where you're, you're, you're hungry for algorithms and sort of higher level of details. My minor pushback here, though, would be this is only the fourth day for a super majority of students programming in any traditional language. So I don't think we've really committed all that much time just yet to the lower level oh, details. Even though I know it feels like that as we sit back here. Mm -hmm. Well, I just asked because it, it's, there's a, there's a line that you've drawn in the sand that um, talks about the specifics of the language itself. Uh -huh. and not wanting to bore people with the, you know, the syntax and actually going over the syntax. Mm -hmm. And yet there's a little bit of that happening here. So. Trying to find where that balance yeah. actually exists is, is, I think, the ultimate goal of the question. I do agree. And I don't know if we've struck the right balance, but I can say I feel that same kind of tension. And that's why the next lecture, especially, we really do context switch to a lot more visual and interactive discussions. And frankly, it's a lot more fun to the lectures, I think, that are about algorithms and data structures and these are insecurity and real world issues. I do think we need to give students the vocabulary and sort of the mental model, um, even syntactically, for those discussions. Um, but even I find it tough, those, uh, not the first one or two, but the second and third, maybe even th uh, fourth and fifth lectures, because they really are uh, very low level. Mm -hmm. But again, that's from the perspective of someone who's been doing this for years. I would, I would emphasize that uh, you know, for many, for most students, this is entirely new. And I did notice it seems like we've kept the abstraction of the size T data type, even for the less comfy version. But this is, uh, these are some screenshots representative of reference 50. No, it's in more comfy mode. No, but it was previously in less comfy mode. And I still saw it before I toggled it. Okay. So here we come back to Zamila's name and this sort of boxing in of the characters in her name, which I think it makes pretty good intuitive sense. Each of these is just char. I'm not sure anyone would disagree with that framing of it or would wrestle with that framing of it. I will admit a bias for people in the orchestra, mostly because it takes them less time to get up to the stage, to be honest. So I have to force myself when I really do want broader participation to really call out to someone and then make sure I can kind of fill the time 
so that it doesn't get too awkward with them strutting all the way to stage from pretty far back. Should select uh, audience members from the, the balcony. That would take all day. <laughs> Go out and down the stairs and back in. <laughs> So this was the first time I ever did this. Um, to recap what I just said, I wanted him to write Zamila's name on the screen, and I had no idea if this example was going to work out. But so far, so good. Because see, okay, it's always funny when something random and unexpected happens. But he wrote it really big, which is good because I want him to kind of start to run out of space before long. Because I want him to wrestle with the matter of even just on a piece of paper and a pencil or the digital incarnation of it. Like, where, how does he lay out these names? What is his pattern? There's no lines on the screen. There's no boxes. So now he's getting. But, it's, but this is very different because he just writes smaller, and you don't necessarily have that. Agreed. That capability. But if I ask him enough names, we're going to get to the point where he really should have had a system for doing this. No, that's okay. And how about Rob? R O B. Unfortunately, we have staff with very short names. <laughs> But now he's kind of come up with a pattern, right? Like they're kind of falling into rows and columns. So how did you go about Abort, abort. So also most of these names are the shortened versions. Uh, well, there's Robert I could have done. Gabriel. Gabriel. It only buys us a few more letters, though. How did you go about deciding where to write I am happy to see that the uh, Tupperware has not made an appearance <laughs> in a couple of days. And that is true, but where on the, what governed where you put Belinda's name and Gabe's name? Okay, so that works, that's fine. So computers what did he say? So I'll often, I missed it this time, we'll often hand the students a mic. I think I must have forgotten here. Mm -hmm. In fact, if we look closely, you might see the microphone on the lectern that I was supposed to hand to him. Oh no, the Tupperware was still there. Oh, oh get over the Tupperware. <laughs> this is me now trying to make sure this example makes sense. Well, it seems like uh, it should have been forced. He should have been forced to put him into. Yeah, but I, mean, I like to see what happens sometimes. Like some of our best examples have been when I do kind of lose control over the demo and something interesting happens. Um, this was the goal to get to, right? To sort of see if we could leap from his instincts to something that's a little more methodical that indeed divides everything equally. <laughs> no, we got to really abort the example. Let's move on to the intended outcome. <laughs> but I'm glad he, he volunteered in this way. We should have just <laughs> I think he waved goodbye. <laughs> Those are just paper boxes, I think. I don't think that's the glassware that you have so that you find so objectionable. I don't think the ping pong balls came back. We'll rewind. We'll rewind. I'm sure it'll show up again. So I'm not sure I would Look, do. It's to the right of the boxes. There it is. Yeah. <laughs> I don't see those. We'll, get, we'll take those out digitally. <laughs> so the goal here, though, of course, was to ultimately try to get to a, a system of representation underneath the hood. I'm not sure if I would do this one again. You know what I might do, and maybe you were suggesting, is pre-draw a grid. Yeah. If I'd already yeah. revealed that tidbit, right. and then let him start filling in the blanks. Because I right. think we could still have a Scrabble-like well, it there. would have been interesting of do you, what happens do you, if you, do you have to put them in order? And do you borrow a letter, like if Belinda and Gabe both have an E, do you maybe Crossword do like style. this? That'd yeah. be, oh my god, that'd be yeah, there you go. mind blowing sort of memory layout. <laughs> and a nice sort of way of compressing or saving space. Yeah. yeah. Well, sort of nice. Not that nice. Painful though, <laughs> to maintain ultimately. And this was really one of the points I wanted us to touch on, is if all you have is this contiguous sequence of characters, how do you know where something begins and ends? And this is actually one of the first and best opportunities, I think, for students to put on the proverbial engineering hat. They don't have to know much about computer science or programming at all, but like, if your only inputs to this problem is 
a, uh, an alphabet, like characters, anything you can type on the keyboard or any other ASCII characters, and you know a priori that the memory can be thought of in this grid, those are the only tools you can bring to bear. So how do you solve this? And I think that's a good theme and a good message for students that even if they are less comfortable, have no prior background, just think about it intuitively. Like a human invented this system. You are human, so surely you could reach the same conclusion. And it's so low level that there's probably not much complexity there. And indeed, the solution is as simple as just a sentinel value at the end, all zeros in this case. I think it'd be interesting also just to show the actual memory representation. So just to just to nail home all of the subjects that we've been talking about in the past few weeks. So capital Z is uh, has an ASCII representation which is, you know, represents or is represented by the number I don't even know what it would be. But we do that. We showed the little chart of the mapping of numbers. Right. Letters. But then but taking it a step further and turning and these into numbers. Taking turning those into binary numbers and then yeah. being able to show that the slash, the backslash zero, the null terminator, is actually I just like a that. representation of all zeros. Because looking at it at first, and, uh, and I heard you describe it just a little bit, uh, or you did actually describe it, but students may be confused, like, why can I fit two characters yeah. into this one No, this you one sold bundle? me. I would probably redraw this to be a little bigger so that we could take the lowercase a and turn that into, like, 97, and then turn it into eight zeros and ones. It also seems problematic to represent it in a, in a matrix, in a two-dimensional so? array. Because, yeah, I, well, because it's really meant to be a sequential. So. And even though that it happens to be represented in yeah. real life by a matrix, that's not. I'm kind of showing my age. I draw it in a manner that's consistent with what I think of as like a memory, like a, a DIM in a computer, like yeah. a memory module in right. a computer. Right. You know, that's true. I mean, we're also pragmatically limited for space. But this yeah. is, actually, this would be an opp opportunity, and we've been thinking a lot more about this for like something animated, mm -hmm. whereby maybe you do have a very long right. sliver with a dot, 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 suggesting that it just goes out as far as you have bytes of memory. But then with a very simple animation, we could sort of move this over here, move this over here just to fit it on screen, and then yeah. zoom in a bit. Yeah. I like that. Or we just have a wide web page that you can scroll along. Scrolling so to, sort of yeah, I was kind of a, yeah, I was assuming slides, but that's even smarter. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's one of the potentially unnecessary hang-ups that I might be introducing. Mm -hmm. It was deliberate, I can't say, it was deliberate that I chose the width of the table, of the, the rows and columns, and the lengths of the names so that we would get right. this forced wrapping, right. so that it's that almost like sense. an email that's wrapping, even though it's per letter, not per word. But I think we can do better. I agree. Yeah. So the next person, I need another variable. So here, this, this is about to be an example involving arrays proper, where I actually want to accumulate more than just one uh, value for, val uh, for some kind of value. And I'm deliberately going down a bad path here. And I, I actually like this general technique, where we introduce a simple problem. How do we store an age? Now we want three ages. Well, let's just go with what we know. And sometimes I'll even deliberately and visually use copy-paste. So you literally just see me like copy, paste, 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 paste. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that even by doing something like that should start to rub students the wrong way. Like, come on, like surely this isn't programming, hitting paste a lot. Like there's got to be a better way. And indeed, this is a little unwieldy if everything has a unique name. And so the, what's nice here, I think, is that we're motivating now the introduction of arrays as a data structure, mm -hmm. not just as an underlying way of thinking about the layout of your memory. Mm -hmm. Like it's actually solving a problem of code. And so this, long story short, is not a good habit, right? I was essentially copying and pasting code and just tweaking the variable name. And my god, if you had not three ages, but 10 or 100 or even It's weird hearing you say a phrase, like, and then say the exact same phrase on the, uh, on the screen. It's, it's oh, uh, do I use the same, do I have the same speech patterns as this version of me? Yeah, it's kind of strange. What I thought no was evolution. funny was I said, long story short, and then I give the long version of the story. <laughs> <laughs> so here too, we're taking advantage of a feature of C99, for instance, whereby we can have an inline dynamic declaration of an array. We don't have to use malloc to get uh, a block of memory for n integers. We can actually do it on the stack uh, with array notation, mm -hmm. which is nice, too, because we can kind of defer until a little later in the term uh, pointers and memory management. So if you want to get not one int, not two int, 
slippery slope, though, to um, if you really want to show them the low level aspect yeah, yeah. to um, actually have them do not C99, but just the original, no, that's go back much, to original C. <laughs> no, some of the enhancements have been a good thing for the language. But this is hard too for a lot of students to wrap their mind around, and I, I often forget this, whereby usage of certain syntax in C and other languages is certainly context sensitive. We see this with the asterisk that's used for pointer declaration and dereferencing. We see this for the declaration of an array and the indexing into an array. And I don't disagree with for the array notation in the square brackets, I don't think it's a bad thing. It's just a block of things. The yeah. pointer one is we'll come to before long. It's a little unfortunate that the same operator, the same symbol, the asterisk is used for semantically very different things. That's hard for students to wrap their mind around. And in fact, we'll, we'll get to this before long, but we made a stylistic choice in CS50 a few years ago to actually stylistically put the star when declaring a pointer next to the data type as opposed to the variable, even though it's a bit non-conventional, and even though it leads to an occasional corner case as to clarity. Um, but we'll come back to that. But it was delivered to try to send the message that the star is relating somehow to the type. Spoiler. No, it makes people want to come back. No, it does. You already, you already gave away the punchline. No, I want to come back. No. no I, I don't want to come back. <laughs> want to come back <laughs> You'll be back. <laughs> this is CS50 Explained with CS50's own Ramon Galvin. <laughs> I'm going to replace you as the Oh, I thought you were trying to change my name. No, no, we'll just swap oh, right. you out. Oh, I got you. One, all the time when writing your own programs, like Mario, Greedy, Credit. Look at it. It's all tying together. I like how you, I like how you type with the one hand. Just to, you just did that motion. Oh, this is when I want to say, like, when you're oh, you typing did, at you home. Did one, you did one oh, finger. Really? Yeah. No, normally I do like this. Yeah, that's, that's what I do too. <laughs> there it is. Did I? <laughs> yeah. I don't know why I do that. <laughs> but this is nice too now. So, um, well, I don't know if it's nice, but the segue I'm trying to make here is now we're introducing command line <laughs> arguments, which we don't spend much detail in. Um, we don't spend that much detail on it right now. It's actually in the problem set. But we wanted to give students an alternative way of collecting input from the user as opposed to just using getString to also get them closer to the kinds of programs that they're using, like Clang and Make and, um, and eventually GDB and other command line tools, and even CD that takes uh, our command line arguments. And I try to do this pretty often with the problem sets. I try to give students, either at the beginning or the end of the week, a verbal teaser as to what's coming. Um, to ideally get as many of them sort of excited about the problems as possible. And like, oh, yeah, that would be a pretty cool thing to dive into. And I, it's nice. We didn't talk about this last week, but with the PSET 1 and Mario's Pyramid, I mean, obviously, all you're using is little hash symbols or pound signs. You're not actually... There's really no fundamental connection to Mario's Pyramid, mm -hmm. but, but just like conjuring up that visual for students, those who are familiar with the game, I mean, I, I do think it makes for a more fun context, and you sort of forgive the fact that it's not nearly as graphical as like the 8-bit system originally was. It's just black and white text, really. But at least you're kind of like, oh, okay, cool. Like, this is a thing. And I don't know if this is compelling, but it feels like it's more interesting than saying, suppose you want to make an arbitrary pyramid yeah. of... Hash symbols. Well, it's certainly more interesting than that. I yeah. think so. So here, too, I was trying to motivate an interest in the hacker edition, too, which most students don't tackle. In fact, if you're wondering, um, it's about 10% of the class tackles the hacker edition at the start of the term, but it actually decays exponentially, 10%, 5%, 2.5%. Um, oh, this is the best part. This oh, is the best so part. Is this is just, we could just Here's could one of my favorite clips from, clip. from Spaceballs. Um, and it's a stretch here, too, because really I'm just trying to extract from this the fact that there's a password involved, which is related to, secu which is related to security and tangentially to cryptography. You know, we, we, this is just a clip just, that we enjoy. We on it? Yeah, we just like, all right, there's no academic. There's, there's, no there's nothing academic, academic yeah. here. It is just a funny, funny thing. Admittedly, there's a lot of students in the room right now, especially those who have to get to another class who are like, 
most students they put though. It's a good way to end. But oh, I, this is the end. Well, we're nearing the end. Oh. It, it is important, obviously, with details like this. Um, like at least here, we try to never run over. It's not fair to the students or to other classes. But you also don't want to hit play on something like this when you have less time uh, left than the video actually requires. Mm -hmm. So even this, it's a little detail logistically, but it's worth being mindful of because you want the attention wrapped there at the end. You don't want the focus on watches and clocks on phones. That usually gets a good laugh. <laughs> Another laugh comes up here. <laughs> People weren't expecting that. That's why it's funny. Did you just... People aren't expecting that either. This is hilarity. I suppose we should do that to CS50. Let's pull the plug. <laughs> Thank you. Can't wait to see Ramon next time. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> Mind you, the only point here is to get to the one, two, three, four, five. Well, there's another. There's another point here. What's the combination? Here it is. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, that's amazing. I've got the same combination on my luggage. Prepare. <laughs> we also try to plant seeds of these like little tidbits in the P set. Like this same joke recurs with President Scrooge in P set seven. Mm -hmm. I think one of the interesting things is, is that. One of the most common passwords is in yeah, fact it, one, two, three, four, five, still. six. Yeah. It's just some sort of scratch. 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 Scratch.